thank you so much for joining, whether you're watching this now or in the future. Uh, I am deciding or trying on to bring back something that I've done over the past few years, um, but I did a few years ago and then I paused it for various reasons, which I can get into at some point if you're ever curious about them. Um, but I wanna bring back Torah in Color, uh, which is a weekly series that I have done to uh, uh, talk from the perspective as a Jewish leader of color with multi-dimensional analysis about this week's Torah portion. So I'm going to try to take a few minutes to share some reflections and share a little bit of Devar Torah about that. And I also wanted to clarify in advance, merci beaucoup, Jere Jeff, uh, that um, I am, some updates if you're not already aware, is that I am going to be ordained as a Jewish priestess this summer. But I want and, not but, and I want to make very clear that I perceive myself and want to embody and be a priestess of the people. I am a person with multi-racial, interfaith, multi-ethnic heritage, and also someone who is just deeply intercultural and interspiritual. Um, and so in terms of my coaching and my leadership, I work with people of all identities and backgrounds. That's really important to know. And also too, I welcome people with all identities and backgrounds to hear some of this Jewish infused wisdom where I uh, briefly will summarize this week's Torah portion, which is a text from the Old Testament, and then riff off of usually just a singular line from that text about contemporary themes I'm seeing show up in our lived experiences, in movement building work, etc. So for those of you who have been wonderful fans a few years ago, uh, Torah in Color may be back. It's back this week. Um, and uh, let's dive in. So uh, this week's Torah portion, and as I'm talking about some of these things, I'm sort of by default assuming a certain level of understanding. So feel free to, if you join me live for one of these sessions and or you catch the replay, so always feel free to ask questions and get clarity. And if um, this or anything else prompts you to want to work with me one-on-one -on -one with you and or your organization or a group of people in a sort of more private group coaching context, feel free to send me a DM and we can set up a time to connect and see what's possible. Okay, so this week's Torah portion and just to reference my sources, I really love using the Torah resources at reformjudaism.org. I am a former executive of the Union for Reform Judaism. And also I just really love the pro progressive perspectives they have. And also they really beautifully summarize um, the passage and offer a range of different perspectives on different subjects. And I just really find that refreshing and invigorating and inspiring. And as you'll see, if I continue to do this, over time that I usually will pick one specific part and give a talk about that. Or sometimes I'll look at the overall themes of the stories um, and themes that were surfaced in that week's Torah portion and talk about them in aggregate. But this week I wanna zero in on a couple different themes. One in particular, and then I might do a secondary Torah and color talk this week if folks are interested about another facet of this week's Torah portion that feels um, particularly timely and relevant. So I really love this brief, quick overview. So this week's Torah portion, the Torah portion that will be read in synagogues around the world, this Saturday, this um, Friday, typically Saturday morning, is Chukat Balak, the ritual law slash Balak. And there's a lot of different things that happen in this Torah portion. And as I mentioned, if you go to reformjudaism.org and then select the banner on the right or the tab on the right that says learning. There's a drop down that has a uh, Torah study and that's where you can access what I'm referring to right now. And there's a number of different things that are happening, but to give a brief overview of some context for this overall piece um, by a summary that's given by Rabbi Leah Berkowitz. Hi, Rabbi Berkowitz, I hope you're doing well. Um, her brief partial summary of this is that this week we read the story of Balaam, a sorcerer hired by the Moabite king to curse the Israelites. 
This tale contains several puzzling elements, a talking donkey, an angel with a fiery sword, and a non-Israelite sorcerer who becomes God's mouthpiece. Oh, interesting. There's also the thread there, if anyone's interested. I'm as someone who's becoming a priestess and who set a goal a few years back to become a modern, multicultural, um, mystic, and monastic. And I feel like I've done that. There's more that we could talk about about that sorcerer piece and religion and perception today. But what I want to zero in on is um, a different part of the Torah portion and talk about themes as it relates to mentorship and leadership and experiences that a number of us find ourselves in that I think doesn't get talked about enough. So there's a portion in a certain part of this Torah portion, there's a passage where, um, in which, where is it here? About, about Aaron and Moses getting the boot. Some of y'all, do you know, what, you know what I'm about to say? Basically, it's a segment in which in the Torah portion it says, which I'm not seeing right now for some reason, ah, here. The people complain they have no water. Moses strikes the rock to get water for them. God tells Moses and Aaron they will not enter the land of Israel. So there's this literal piece here about um, there being two leaders who were at the center of guiding and shepherding their people to liberation, and they're actually at that point, and they are not allowed to enter the land of, uh, they're not allowed to join the people in the context of uh, liberation and all the work that they helped to facilitate and make possible. <sighs> Much has been spoken about this, and I want to bring my JOC specific framing from my lived experience um, in all the different facets of my identity, including being a Duke color, to this. Okay, so I want to reference one more text to give us some grounding before I dive in on a resource sheet. All of this is available on that page that I directed you to. Um, an overview sheet that was prepared by Eric Polakoff. Um, it doesn't say here that Eric is a rabbi, so Eric, if you are, and I didn't accurately cite you, I apologize, but um, so in this, it's noted here a focal point, and actually this is, it's actually he's just quoting the text itself. Oh, um, and this actually lends itself to this other <laughs> secondary Devar Torah or uh, speech or contemporary reflection anchored in uh, Torah that I could give. But, um, quote, but Adonai said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to affirm my sanctity in the sight of the Israelite people, therefore you shall not lead this congregation into the land that I have given them. <sighs> Those are the waters of Meribah, meaning that the Israelites quarreled with Adonai through which God affirmed his sanctity. Numbers chapter 20. So <sighs> here's the context. And here's what, when I first read this piece about Aaron and Moses not being invited are not being allowed, permitted to enter the land of Israel, the final destination, the desired, radically imagined, <laughs> radically explained uh, land flowing in milk and honey, <laughs> the, the big, the big victorious conclusion, you know, is to me what it brings up is our themes that I've been thinking about a lot over the past few years in particular, and I think a number of social justice leaders could relate to this around the inherent tension that exists intergenerationally among social change leaders, and honestly, quite frankly, even with parents and, and their offspring and their children, specifically their adult children, but also perhaps teens and adolescents as well. And uh, I'm just really feeling it. So basically, what I wanted to share about this is sort of riffing off of that piece about Aaron and Moses not entering the land of Israel is that I just noticed that there is a dynamic tension that different people, depending upon the amount of healing, insight, or unhealed harm that they possess, different elders or mentors manage this dynamic differently, or parents manage this dynamic differently. But I've been really intrigued, been very intrigued uh, by the inherent tension that exists with the student, teacher, mentor, teacher, parent 
offspring dynamic where in the best of circumstances, leaders and as individuals, we do the best, the very best, most usually, with the knowledge and understanding we have. And often we take things further. We push the envelope and we fight hard often and diligently to learn, to, to learn as much as we can and to iterate beyond the current limitations and take that as far as we can possibly take it. And then with all of our love and commitment and devotion, teach that to our students, to our mentees, to our children, for our offspring, right? And give them that so that they don't have to go through all those different painful lessons and they can just take the very best of what we've been able to cultivate and fight for, whether it's personally in our living and or our leadership. I mean, really just like blood, sweat and tears kind of stuff at times in movement building, in uh, fighting through trauma, through these different pieces. And the inherent tension that exists is for the recipients of that profound wisdom, if they so choose to accept it, which at times we don't, but oftentimes many of us do, and I think in different ways to varying degrees, all of us can relate in one way or another to both of the figures or people or characters in this story, in this narrative, um, you know, can relate to being a sort of Moses and Aaron figure versus the Israelites who are being guided by Moses and Aaron. feeling so much, but I want to be thoughtful that you're listening and not delay the point. The inherent tension is that all of that stuff that we fought so hard for is often still the starting point for our students, for our offspring, or our people. And depending upon how much resourcing we have, in any given moment, and again, depending upon if in that specific area we do or don't have unhealed harm, <laughs> um, despite our greatest visions for our students, for our mentees, for our children, for our offspring, um, if, if we don't have the proper resourcing, despite all of that incredible work that we did to cultivate this amazing gem of insight and wisdom, when we pass it along, that still is inherently that person's starting point. In the, so in the best case scenario, in the best case scenario, that is that person's starting point around these different points. And they're going to continue the process of really considering it. So first like buying into it and then being like, okay, yeah, I see that that makes sense. Wow, that's amazing. But then they still have years of living to further iterate and take it farther. And for a lot of us along that journey, who've been in the mentee, teacher, passer of wisdom, passer honor of wisdom role, right? The bestower of wisdom role, that often, since we're not living in a vacuum, we're living in the context of systemic oppression and intergenerational trauma and harm. And we navigate through all that and have scratches and bruises and scars. And we bring, ideally, much of the time, this beautiful, this, this baby, this, this profound body or specific piece of knowledge and insight that is pristine, as pristine as we could get it, as much as we possibly could, right? And, and that it's not as, as though along that path, unless we had it, which sometimes does happen in different ways, it does, but other times, as a number of us perhaps can relate to with our mentors, um, they have done really amazing work and yet they've still endured a number of scars and bruising and, 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 an, and an accumulation of harm that has gone chronically unhealed. Such that this can lead to, as a friend of mine uh, recently shared, um, a fellow Jewish social justice leader, a pattern of over-eldering that can happen where it, I think for most 
people who are over eldering or over mentoring it was never their intent to be controlling but they have all these wounds and things that they accumulated on the way to getting this wisdom and so what can end up happening is a number of us i've had this in a couple different areas of my living and i still continue to hope i'm an eternal optimist that uh, in time that that pain points and points where i needed to depart because the dynamic started getting unhealthy and overly controlling and not liberatory um, and had to make a break or open up space that that those ties can be reconnected in time when both parties are ready but it just can put people in a position where they've been a mentee or a student um, you know of of someone's great teaching but that still is often at certain times their beginning point. So they're going to do actually what is right to do and to continue that body of work in different ways with even greater liberatory consciousness because all of that work we did is, is now their starting point. And so to me, there's just an inherent tension and hook that or a potential for a, a potential hook there um, where the person who did all that work can end up feeling left behind, even though the other person at times is often reaching for them, but they're, but, but that person, if they haven't had enough healing interventions, has reached a limit, a developmental intellectual limit, and is not without additional supports, which is why I created my Grounded and Growing program and specifically the Shema process to help people evolve. Um, uh, in spite of or and because of immense amounts of pain and and trauma they've endured that they have a framework to help them navigate through that and so that they can reach for the next generation and still be the resource that a number of us really need but for a number of our elders and not all some are in a healthy place for any number of different reasons but a number of elders they can get they can have some what's the, a cognitive distortion happen and begin to treat their mentees like threats when in fact their mentees are actually endeavoring to honor the legacy that their elders and mentors and leaders have established and are continuing it farther and noticing further places where that body of work can use greater liberatory healing and clarification and take it as far as we can but at times those elders can feel and mentors can feel left behind even if it actually isn't true and in fact because they are not able to reach the way they want um, they may go into controlling patterns and at times the mentees may try to stick around but after a while they're they take on maladaptive efforts rather than simply saying at times which mind you is like a tall order i'm feeling left behind do you mind looping me in and, and actually having the tools and resources, which again is what we provide in the context of Grounded and Growing, to understand more clearly what's happening in their inner landscape and to notice that it's actually about their old hurt that they're being reminded of and that actually their student or mentee shining and taking the work farther and continuing that work and wanting to do it with them, but that actually is the best case scenario but that inherently, because of this backlog of harm, it can elicit a lot of bitterness and unhelpful maladaptive patterns from the very leaders and people who helped us younger leaders and mentors get to, and change makers get to where we are. And this can obviously play out in terms of parent, parental offspring, children dynamics, and especially with adult children that it's sad at times to see that we are the beneficiaries of our parents' dreams, but that at times their dreams were born of unmet needs that have chronically remained unmet, which we often at times may or may not even have known because they kept it hidden from us. But then upon seeing us soar and take it farther, that opens some of those wounds, right? So. I just wanted to share this and just offer a lot of compassion to both parties in this scenario, right? Like no one is wrong in this case. Like there might be patterns that are not helpful in either case, like perhaps at times a lack of gratitude or a lack of capacity to understand, although I'm really not a fan in general of 
positioning anyone to be a mind reader. Um, and I think open, nonviolent, and loving communication is helpful in any scenario. And us resourcing ourselves to be able to do that is a whole body of work in and of itself, right? And, um, but that, that everyone in this scenario is truly doing the best they can with the knowledge and understanding they have. And what's missing is some additional resourcing and support, right? So my kavana, my intention for our movements, for our families, for our professional relationships where important work is being done on a number of different fronts is that um, we continue, right? Like just let's just acknowledge and appreciate what's going well here, that we continue to advance um, visionary leadership and radical imagination and doing the best, the very best we can in, with the knowledge and understanding that we have, um, but then also meet that striving with moments of rest and celebration and appreciation for the progress we've made and also meet those challenges where the generation before and whatever, whether it's literal generation or just the predecessors, where they are reaching so intensely, right? And then, and then we are taking that, those batons in different ways and running with it that we, that both parties in that scenario get some additional trauma agile support around understanding in different ways why each party is, party is acting the way that we're acting. Because I see this being a source of undermining of our movements and of some frailty that happens, right? That there's miscommunication that I see happening between mentors and mentees, specifically in communities that have been targeted for destruction or groups of people, so like women, black folks, people of color, uh, Jews, that I notice this tension can be even more acute when the predecessors have really navigated harrowing terrain. And so I just wanna open this up and um, I have any number of different hopes. I've just named some of my Kaba notes, some of my intentions. Another intention I would say is that if you've experienced tension around these dynamics in either direction from either position or perhaps both positions. Recently in my work, I've started, I've started to prepare myself as I gear up to perhaps, hopefully, maybe become a parent. Like I need to brace myself that I have all of this phenomenal wisdom and insight and that this is going to be my kid's starting point. This is just their baseline and they're going to take it farther. So I need to be doing my work now in anticipation of what I've seen some of my mentors experience so that I don't respond maladaptively and I am nourishing myself and gearing myself up for being agitated in places where I've gone as far as I can by my offspring, by my students, and that I welcome that and that that is part of progress and it's not a part of the problem, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue to access a range of modalities that help us heal from those old problems and those old wounds that never got healed. And that actually, in light of the next generation taking the space to do that, those might be good moments. Even as us, I'm both. I both. I'm like at that point where I'm in both camps. But as us, as us future and current mentor, even as we are still evolving and still offering things from our points of strength, that also perhaps we can take acknowledge that future generations, whether it's around age or just lineages of social change movements and social change work and leadership and innovation on any number of fronts, that them picking up that baton and carrying it and doing it slightly different than us can buy us some spaciousness to not only keep leading powerfully, but to go back for the parts of ourselves that didn't get the resourcing they need and to resource and honor those points of pain because that is one of, at times the only and some of the best ways that we can enable greater evolution and agility for us, right? For those of us who, and I'm saying this, I'm not, it's not exactly applicable to me in some ways as someone who's been a young elder in a particular movement space, but, but for those of us, whoever we may be, who are the old dogs in the crew, that we can have spaciousness to continue to learn new tricks and new movement modalities and experience the ongoing evolution that, um, we can either be part of or that is beyond our capacity that we can savor it and enjoy it. That's what I want for some of my most 
some of my most beloved elders who I see suffering, movement elders, some of whom who are literally um, elders and at times are movement elders who might only be 10 years older than me, say, but are brilliant leaders who have been trailblazers in different 20 or 10 or 20 years older, who have been brilliant trailblazers and upon who to me are like regal, who, who have a standing that nothing that has ever done can undo the legacy that they've already established. And I want for some of those leaders to be able to savor that work, even at times if they are in the position of Aaron and Moses, and there are certain thresholds for any number of reasons by design or because of their own internal choice, they can't cross over a certain threshold um, and that they have space to mourn some of that and also that they savor and honor the fact that that passing of the threshold for the next generation wouldn't be possible if it weren't for all of their remarkable contributions and the immense gratitude that perhaps not enough, but a number of us do genuinely feel and will never forget and will consistently honor even as we're all continuing to evolve and grow. And so that is my Torah in color, Devar Torah, my uh, Torah talk for this week. <laughs> After a three-ish year, two-year <laughs> hiatus, um, hope this was valuable. Feel free to share if you have any questions or thoughts about what resonated with you. Um, and I'm excited to continue the conversation from here. Much love. And also, if this resonated with you, please forward this. If there's someone or a group of people who you think would appreciate uh, this message or find it valuable or generative or positively, or productively, divinely agitational, then please feel free to share it. And I look forward to continuing the conversation either this week or whenever you come across this. Much love and thanks for to those who tuned in either in the live and or the replay. And uh, we'll see if this is a weekly thing or a monthly thing I do, but um, I'm excited to find out along with you. Much love for now and cheers to the mentors and leaders, right? May we be able to experience um, vegan or not vegan, <laughs> milk and honey, lands of milk and honey in our work, even if we can't or are not able to partake in all of it just by, for any number of reasons, that we still are able to enjoy the sweetness and the fruits of our labor that we did typically not for those fruits, for, for the good we could bring, and that we're able to see that good that we have in fact helped to facilitate and advance. Much love until next time.